Good evening, everyone. I hope you can all hear me and I hope you can all see uh, the screen. Um, my name is Shannon Hogan. I am an archaeologist for the National Trust. Um, I support all of our teams working across the regions. Um, and my, my boss and colleague, Tom, who was going to do the introductions, is having terrible internet trouble. So I'm sort of picking up the pieces and doing a, a less... Uh, a less good job of it than he probably would be right now. So thank you very much for your patience and thank you very much for joining us. Um, this evening is being run by the Council for British Archaeology. So thank you to Debbie and Claire who are working in the background to make this all work. Uh, and it's an evening with three of our National Trust archaeologists. Um, a lot of people, I think, still don't even know that we have archaeologists in the National Trust, but we have people working in all our different regions uh, looking after everything from prehistory right the way through to sort of modern historical buildings and features, um, incredible range of work that they do, an incredible range of sites that they look after. So just a few little pieces of housekeeping that I, that I have to do. Um, thank you everyone uh, for saying hello in the chat. If you have questions along the way for any of the three uh, panelists who will be talking, then, oh wow, you dog with Martin Carver, brilliant. Um, if you have any questions, there is a Q&A button, which you'll see just to the left of your chat. If you please use that, and those questions will be moderated by Debbie and Claire in the background, and then we'll field those questions to the team at the end of the three presentations. Um, not that anyone here is going to put in any abusive or aggressive language, but please refrain from any nasty comments. I'm sure there won't be any. We have the power to boot people out if we need to, but we don't want to have to use that. Um, and just to let you know, there will also be a very short three question survey at the end of the whole session. So after the Q&A, um, it would be lovely if you could fill it out just for a little bit of feedback for the Council for British Archaeology. We'd very much appreciate that. So I hope everyone has a drink of some kind, a cup of tea, something stronger, perhaps uh, maybe some snacks and are very, very comfortable, ready to set in for the evening. We have three presentations. Uh, Mark Newman, who is one of our archaeologists, works in the Northeast region, uh, looks after incredible places, Fountains Abbey being one of the most um, significant places in his care, and very excited to hear about all the research that's happening. Uh, we continue to make incredible discoveries at Fountains Abbey, so Mark's going to talk us through some of the, the recent discoveries that they've had there and what that means for the future of, of Fountains Abbey. Then we have Laura Howarth from Sutton Hoo, who has the incredible job of managing uh, one of our most significant archeological places. And as some of you may know, we have the Swords of Kingdoms exhibition temporarily at Sutton Hoo, which is a phenomenal uh, exhibition to see. A lot of the pieces um, are from uh, Burial Mound One, and a lot of the pieces which aren't from there are thought to have a connection to East Anglia because there's, there's um, there's some belief that a lot of the pieces have been manufactured <clears throat> in East Anglia. So it's really nice to see some of those pieces essentially coming home. So she's gonna talk us a little bit about that and some of the objects that are on display. And finally, we have Nancy Grace, who's in the Southwest of the region, um, Southwest of the country, sorry. And she's going to be talking about pottery and how the smallest of sherds can tell some of the greatest of stories. Um, I think everybody knows that we have a lot of pottery. We have boxes and boxes of materials, but what can we actually learn from all this material? So Nancy's going to give us a really good talk through what we can learn from that. Um, yes, I think that is about all I need to cover. I'm not getting any flags from anyone in the background telling me that I didn't say anything, so I hope I've covered everything. So without further ado, sit back and please enjoy the presentations. <clears throat> Thank you, Shannon, and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Newman, and I am National Trust's archaeologist on the east side, or as we like to think of it, the sunrise side of our north region. Um, and I've been working for the National Trust. It first came to work for the Trust at Fountains, and interests have spread beyond that. So uh, I cover the bit now from berwick upon tweed in one corner down to the boundaries of Greater Manchester in the other. Um, and uh, just about 34 years I've been working with the organisation, so starting to feel quite archaeological myself. But my subject this evening is going back to my first love, uh, fountains, and talking to you a little bit about some of the recent discoveries that have been made there, looking beneath the surface of the site. Um, and 
it's really an aspect of one of the joys of being a National Trust archaeologist is in rather than working in the commercial sector and we look at a site and then someone comes and builds on it and that's the end of the thing, we develop long term relationships with our properties. And the longer one goes on in the job, the more you realise that every landscape is absolutely packed full of secrets and answers. And the reason why we don't know it all already is we haven't asked it the right questions. And working for the trust means you're about long enough for being able to ask all sorts of new questions that you never thought to ask before. <clears throat> and that's kind of led us into the discoveries at Fountains. So the discovery stuff, for those of you who don't know where Fountains is, let me fill you in just briefly. We're up in the uh, wonderful county of North Yorkshire, northern bit of uh, England, and the Fountains Abbey estate is two miles west of the city of Ripon. So on the aerial photograph, you just see the edge of the city here. And in 1983, the National Trust acquired about 900 acres inside the area I'm indicating with the cursor. Uh, Fountains is down over here uh, at the corner of the property. Um, the rest of which is part of the uh, Aislaby designed landscape, which now together with the ruins of the Abbey was inscribed as a World Heritage Site in uh, 1986. So that business of secrets uh, and stories exists in every landscape. And what we're finding here, that includes some of the very best investigated. There's quite a lot of, well, why do you even bother looking at Fountains Abbey? The abbey that you see today was comprehensively excavated uh, through the course of the uh, late 1840s and the 1850s by the chap in the upper left-hand corner, John Richard Walbrun. Um, and as my old uh, lecturer at, at Birmingham, Peter Gelling, used to say, dug like potatoes. Um, they shoveled out feet and feet and feet, 12 feet in some points of, of archaeological deposits into railway wagons and carted it away to tip somewhere else along with a lot of the finds. <clears throat> and that's left us not with the abbey that was part of the designed landscape, that was a picturesque ruin which sort of grew organically from the ground, but a proper Ministry of Tidy Monuments stripped back. You can see every stone of the abbey and by golly you need to do that on a visit like every Victorian thought. So they kind of scrubbed the abbey. It was all done and dusted and a monograph describing the history of the site published in 1900. And to be honest, in the 20th century, certainly the first half of it, there was very little archaeology done on this site because it all had all been wrapped up. In 1967, it became a guardianship site and uh, the uh, Department of the Environment, latterly English Heritage, now um, uh, Historic England became involved with the site, and the chap down on the right here, Glyn Kopak, did some excavations in the crossing of the Abbey Church and on some of the minor buildings of the site, but it's kind of the late 20th century work was mostly about it reinterpreting with Glyn, with Stuart Harrison, for example, the architecture and the dating of particular parts of the site, but it was all job done, wasn't it? Well, in the 21st century, we've been looking beneath the ground with new technology, and it's becoming clear just how much of the story is yet to be told. Some of the technology relates to stuff we've done for a long time, parch marks, very popular subject at the moment, just beginning to hit the, the headlines again. But now working with a group of partners who include the University of Bradford, um, Geoscan Research, uh, Magnitude Surveys and Guideline Geo, we've been throwing technologies at the site in new ways. And even with parch marks, the use of drones and high resolution photography is ena enabling us to, to, to read this ages old evidence uh, in much more detail. If you look at the, the image um, on the right, you'll see what I mean when you start using high uh, high definition photography and a bit of luck catching parch marks in exactly the right moment. Uh, you see here the outline of the Lay Brothers Cloister uh, that was demolished at the dissolution, rags of it survived until the 1760s and then it was taken away. But we caught this on just the perfect evening. We actually see individual stones of the walls uh, highlighting the parch marks with a 16th century farm enclosure going through here, the much stronger feature, and lots and lots of detail coming through paved um, route ways through the Abbey, which there had been no previous evidence that these things existed. And that parch mark was the focus of some of our geophysical uh, investigations as well. Um, the uh, area in front of the Abbey here, known as the West Green, we now know was occupied by an enormous third guest hall, which in this image was looked at in some fairly um, early development uh, resistivity survey by John Skomansky of the University of York in the 1990s. We've, the uh, research team working on the site now, 
um, have looked at it again with modern equipment and we're able to produce uh, much more, a much higher resolution uh, imagery of this building, which is a fascinating, enormous structure. For those of you who, who, who know fountains, it's roughly the same size as the nave of the church. Um, so a huge building that was removed uh, either in late in the, of the history of the Abbey or in the post-dissolution period. It's been called a guest hall, and that's the received wisdom, but we are now starting to wonder whether or not, given that it's the same size and the same orientation as the nave of the church, whether it had an ecclesiastical function at an earlier stage before the present nave of the church was constructed. But that's a longer story for another day. A lot of the work that we do is driven by rather mundane things. So a rather exciting story began with looking for a drain. Uh, our head of landscape needed to replace drainage to the central part of the site. How do you get drains across a site like this without damaging its archaeology? And I remembered that there was a Victorian newspaper account of putting drainage in after the Warburn excavations. So we spoke to uh, Mike Langton of uh, 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 Geoline uh, Geo, uh, who are the ground penetrating radar uh, specialists, whether or not he could pick up the line of the drain. Mike said he'd have a go at it and it all looked quite interesting. Um, and the upshot uh, was the image over here on the right. I'm gonna play it uh, as a video for you to see. We're now going down through the ground surface. What we're looking for, according to the report, is a drain running through there. And perhaps you can see that there is something of a mark showing. So as we go down through the ground, you've got the depth indicator here, approximately speaking, so up to 75 centimeters beneath the surface. And oh dear, here's a shocker, journalist is inaccurate um, because actually the drain run is over here, uh, not where we were expecting it and not where we needed it at all. And I sat and I looked at that image and I thought, hmm, that's kind of interesting. I wonder what all those rectangular things are. And then the penny dropped. And I remembered that that newspaper account talked about the drain cutting through stone lined bunk bed graves in the monastic gra graveyard. We were, didn't set out to look for evidence of a cemetery, but what we were able to plot is a total now of something like 2000 grave cuts with their stone linings across the cemetery. Generally speaking, monastic cemeteries are not overstudied parts of monastic sites. I mean, kind of, you think, nice, easy thing, we know what's going on there, it doesn't need to be investigated, and how wrong that is proving to be. We now extended the area of survey, so the east end of the Abbey Church is over here, and what we can see in the data is that there are at least eight different zones of this cemetery with different types of burial practice and different alignments within it that reflect a sequential development, not only of the use of a site, but of the uh, burial practices, the theological beliefs, which the, the community are adhering to at particular points in time. This is telling us about the sociology and the religious practice of this place. It also really connects you back to the place that you know monks are always part of the story at Fountains. One, you've got that on your head, but they've gone away, right? No, um, they're still here and they always have been. This is really powerful, emotive archaeology. But the story didn't quite stop there. So that's where we were with the monastic cemetery. And to the left, you can see uh, the remains of the abbey. Um, Mike then came along to me and he said, well, I'd like to do a test drive with this new equipment. I could do that in the car park in Ilkley behind my house, or I could come out to Fountains. What do you think? And I said, well, it would be very nice if you came out. And what he wanted to look at was how far along the valley to the right the cemetery extended. So he took his machine out for a test drive and we did the bit in orange, the sort of first third um, of the long, long, long East Green at Fountain. So the monastic precinct is well off the screen to your right, the monastic precinct wall. And there's never really been an explanation of what's going on in this space. You would wonder if they did running races or something like that. It seems to be ideally uh, suited to, to that sort of purpose. But that wasn't quite what we found evidence for. So there's our friend, the monastic cemetery that you're now familiar with. Um, and then part two came up with this. Fountains is a type site. It is, has been since the uh, beginning of the 18th century has been considered to be the exemplar of Cistercian sites. And it's plan the plans of the Abbey really haven't developed and evolved or many new buildings added to it since that date. And what we have over to the right here 
are enormous monastic structures. Compare them, for those of you who know the site, the width and length of this building in relation to the Chapel of the Nine Altars. These are big things. Now, I must say that this little bit of film, I'm afraid, is very fast and I can't slow it down, but it, or I can't, I found a way to slow it down. Um, but this again is going down through the site, layer by layer. And when you go down at depth, depth indicator on the left again, there are the outlines of the buildings with their column bases. And the wonderful thing about radar, of course, is it gives you depth information about the things that you're looking at. So you come back up, there are eight columns in the left-hand building. As you go back down, there's a wall across the end one. So there is the geophysics giving you a sort of cross profile, but there is a, a, a platform at the northern end of the structure on which the, the columns are based. And if you come up closer to the surface, you get details like uh, subdivision walls appearing. So the building was part demolished during its life, then saw another phase of life. And we know that the, 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 we believe this building is a tannery um, and it was being leased in the Tudor period. So that is emerging from this geophysical data. The splodges that you can see in the center of the, of the, the feature we believe are steeping pits and it's part of the tanning process. And there's a second building and possibly a third as well over there. Um, part of our work has been comparing different geophysical techniques um, and we've done magnetometry and resistivity over this site as well. And it really emphasizes how ground penetrating radar is a new way of seeing. So the image at the bottom here is the magnetometry at work. Um, and I'm sure that you will pick out that there are a number of features of interest here. Uh, quite interesting sort of spotted effect over the cemetery, which is actually nothing to do with the cemetery at all. We've uh, investigated that a little bit further and they are pits with some sort of industrial residue in them, which could be post monastic. Um, but it is interesting, I think, when you can see the radar here, you can pick up that there are related linears in the magnetometry but I challenge anybody to say that they'd actually pick out what this building was from, from that technique. And the resistivity doesn't touch it at all. It's uh, generally below the depth at which resistivity will operate, though we have got it with um, electrical resistance tomography doing vertical sections across the site. So here is the new discovery that we announced at the end of last year. Um, the tannery buildings uh, with their relationship with the river. And we now think that the building extended across the river um, and spanned it as so many of the early buildings do. And these are really on as examples of other really massive monastic buildings, um, <clears throat> such as the Great Cotswold Barn and Glastonbury Abbey Barn reconstruction, which is probably quite similar to this structure. But these great barn structures are late 13th, 14th, even sometimes 15th century buildings. Because of the archaeology on other parts of the site, we, are, we think that these buildings that we've discovered are actually of the 1160s. And as such at the moment, they are without parallel in British monastic uh, archaeology, as indeed the identification of a purpose dedicated tannery um, is, is also unique. And these things have ramifications beyond what you might imagine. You know, tannery is interesting, we all know they might have, have done tanning, but actually it's at the center of the monastic mission. The, new, the part of the purpose of the abbey was to create daughter houses and granddaughter houses, all of whom had to be equipped with religious books. And here is one of the surviving books from fountains using um, leather and parchment, we think processed in the building in question. Um, you can't create an, a new monastic house unless it's got all its religious books, so you need to be mass producing the materials that go with it. Also, the lay brethren, who are often an overlooked part of the monastic community, were distinguished from the monks because they slept under animal skins, they dressed in animal skins because of their waterproof uh, qualities. Um, and you know, if you've got, say, 400 lay brothers working here, they have all got to be equipped, which is why in the 1160s we've gone over into um, uh, industrial scale leather production. So this is just a, a reminder. Historically speaking, Fountains Abbey, a type site. Now, with our geophysics, we are adding more and more buildings onto that type site model, and we have more of a site yet to uh, investigate. I, come out and wave my hands around um, and 
<laughs> get the round of applause at the end with a following wind. But this really has been a group project. And the people who are involved, Mike, Chris, Roger uh, and Tom who are on this image and Chris Gaffney who stepped out of it at the wrong moment have been extraordinarily generous with their time and with their support and have revealed so much about the site and we have so much more still to go. I'm immensely grateful to them. They have done an amazing job. And the next little bit of the amazing job as we unfold further, also as part of Festival of, of British Archaeology uh, is that you can come and see us do the next bit of radar work um, on Saturday the 30th of July when our target is going to be the monastic church and the plan of the church, the speculated plan of the early stone church um, which came out of Glyn Copax excavations uh, in 1979-1980. He only saw the bit that's darker here. He speculated about the rest. Well we're going to see if the radar can tell us any more about that building which vanished in 1160 and hasn't been seen since. And if you're, you've still got an appetite for more, on the Sunday I'll be taking people around the site and showing them these things actually on the ground. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you, Mark. That was absolutely wonderful and just really goes to show how exciting our job is that places that we think that we understand can just keep revealing more and the story ever, ever changes. So wonderful, Mark. Thank you. We will go straight to Laura. Um, just a reminder, any questions, try and put them in the Q&A section so we don't miss any. Thank you very much. And over to Laura Sutton, who? Thank you, Shannon. Um, just going to get my presentation up, everyone. Uh, good evening and thank you for joining us all. I'm speaking to you live from Sutton Hoo uh, this evening as well. Um, so yes, my name is Laura. I'm the Archaeology and Engagement Manager here at National Trust Sutton Hoo and I'm here to talk to you about our current temporary exhibition, Swords of Kingdoms, the Staffordshire Hoard at Sutton Hoo, which is a celebration of a golden and garnet adorned age of Anglo-Saxon craftsmanship. The exhibition is part of the Releasing the Sutton Hoo Story project, which has been supported by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, the New Anglia Local Enterprise Partnership and individual donors and supporters. The exhibition features 60 original Anglo-Saxon objects on loan from the British Museum, the Potteries and Birmingham Museums and Art Galleries and Norwich Castle Museum and Art Gallery. Whilst the vast majority of objects on display are from the Staffordshire Hoard, Swords of Kingdoms is really special as it also includes objects from Mound Worn Sutton Hoo and from wider across 7th century East Anglia. It's a real special homecoming, these objects from Mound One discovered here 83 years ago, but also as I was go on to discuss, we think that some of the objects from the Staffordshire Hoard may have originally been made in these same East Anglian workshops that served Royal Sutton Hoo. And the exhibition marks the first time that the Staffordshire Hoard has been exhibited in East Anglia, so really special on numerous uh, counts there. Um, and just to say, as we move through the presentation, if you see an orange star, um, that's to indicate that that's an object that you can see in the exhibition. But I've included objects from the wider world of the Anglo-Saxons for comparison. So let's get stuck in. Um, so just a bit of background first and foremost about the Staffordshire Hoard. So the first objects from the Staffordshire Hoard were discovered by metal, de metal detectorist Terry Herbert, who had the permission of the landowner on the 5th of July 2009 on farmland near Litchfield in Staffordshire. Over the next couple of days, the gold rush continued as more and more objects were discovered within um, the plough soil. You can see how shallow it is here. And Herbert said it was like a crop of potatoes. At this point, the portable antiquity scheme were notified and a plan quickly developed to excavate and investigate further. And a variety of different methods were used over time, including metal detecting, resistivity, magnetometry and aerial photography. It's the largest hoard of Anglo-Saxon gold and silver metalwork ever discovered. Some of the objects were newly crafted when buried, but others may have been about 100 years old. And more objects were discovered uh, during um, subsequent investigation in 2012. The objects are predominantly from a martial context, so that's to say from weaponry fittings, but a couple of objects are from a religious context, but nothing uh, definitively kind of female in character, such as brooches. Only the precious parts of the weapons were kept, no blades, and mainly gold and silver was used, so little use of base metals such as copper alloy. 
Um, there's several different theories as to why it was buried, which we'll come on to, um, but what we can say is it was a specially curated collection that was buried. So just a couple of maps here to show um, the hoard in its immediate environs um, with Roman and Anglo-Saxon finds and sites overlaid. So Staffordshire hoard found in a field in the parish of Hammerwich, so south of the A5 and west of the M6 toll. It was buried near the top of a hill near Watling Street. So um, obviously Watling Street being the main Roman artery running from Dover through London to Viriconium or Roxeter, so um, Roman city which is uh, now in today in Shropshire. And um, the road was probably in use during the 7th century and was a distinctive uh, landmark on the horizon of scrub and woodland. So coupled with the proximity to Roman roads and accessible point, the location for the burial of the hoard seems to have been chosen for a very particular reason. Um, so yes, that's just to explain where it's kind of uh, the hoard is found. Uh, manually moving on, uh, just quickly, uh, 7th century kingdom map. So obviously Anglo-Saxon uh, England doesn't exist um, at this point. It's made up of lots of different kingdoms. Um, I'm speaking to, to you today from Sutton Hoo down here in the kingdom of East Anglia. And the star is in indicating where the staff was found in the Kingdom of Mercia. And also on the, uh, the map, we can also see five major battles fought during the 7th century between uh, 616 and 679, but we don't know of any battles um, that were fought in the immediate vicinity of the Horde site. Um, very quickly, a selective timeline just to root ourselves. We all love a good timeline. Uh, so the Staffordshire Horde is tied up with the Kingdom Wars of the 7th century as kings sought to retain and expand their territories and power. One of the big kind of power um, players at the time was Penda, who was a pagan king of Mercia who ruled between 630 and 655. And Penda's death marks the end of pagan kingship in England. Um, in that time, he killed five Christian Anglo-Saxon kings, um, um, Game of Thrones, eat your heart out here. And uh, three of those were kings of East Anglia. And they are all successors and or relations of Radwald. So Radwald, we can't say for certain who the man who was buried in Mound 1 at Sutton who was, but Radwald is the name that most often emerges as the most likely contender. The Staffordshire Hoard is thought to have been buried between 650 and 670, but most of the objects date from between 570 to 650, so contemporary with Sutton Hoo, and it's of such a rare quality such as the objects from Royal Sutton Hoo. Pie charts here, just to quickly show you um, some of the broad object categories within the hoard represented in the, um, the top pie chart by weight. And then the bottom one is showing you uh, sword, say, say and scabbard fittings by object count. At the end of the conservation process, a total of almost 4,600 fragments have been recorded from the Staffordshire Hoard. Due to pre-depositional dismantling and post-depositional fragmentation, it's hard to say exactly how many objects in total, but likely over 600 objects totaling around 4 kilograms of gold and 1.7 kilograms of silver. Uh, it is true that all that glitters is gold, so you can see the gold fittings outnumber the silver by a ratio of more than 4 to 1. It's estimated that the fittings in the Staffordshire Hoard come from around 100 to 150 swords whose owners would have taken part in some of the greatest battles of the day. So swords were valuable and very occasionally placed with the dead and swords with ornate fittings such as those at Sutton Hoo were very rare. Many of the sword fittings in the Staffordshire Hoard so show signs of wear and tear, so in circulation for many years and possibly handed down through generations. Um, as we know from the old English poem Beowulf, we know that swords could take on a legendary status. And here, just for anyone who uh, wants a refresher on their sword anatomy, here we've got a grip and two guards um, of horn, bone or wood were fixed over the tang of the iron blade to which the metal fittings were then attached. And I've just included here a photo of um, a replica of uh, the mound one sat who um, sword, so you can see how it all fits together. It's worth saying that um, many of the objects on display as part of Swords of Kingdoms are tiny, um, but they are all relative to the size and proportion of the sword overall. And it just makes you wonder at the amazing craftsmanship of the Anglo-Saxons. And just to kind of recap, and then we're going to delve into the objects, don't worry everyone, uh, recap on some of the different decorative techniques used. Each piece is like a piece of haute couture fashion, very much personalised to the individual, but they are using a set um, established range of decorative techniques. So here we've got filigree work, which is um, very popular, and it's um, using kind of gold wire, it's a granular ornamentation, and you can see these animals here emerging from this uh, twisted wire. 
We've then got cloisonne work, um, which has got um, waffle foils backing slithers of garnet. And the foils themselves, uh, garnet can be quite a dull stone. So the, the waffle foil is acting a bit like a bike reflector light and they illuminate in these kind of ruby red. We've also got casting, such as the pommel here. Um, we've also got decorative inlays uh, on top of this uh, um, lovely pyramid. We've got some glass inlays as well as the garnets. And um, yeah, sometimes the immensely skilled Anglo-Saxon craftspeople could show off um, more than one technique. So this um, pommel here has got a gold mount. Um, it's got garnets. It's got filigree. It's got the whole kitchen sink thrown at it as well. So let's turn to some of the objects in um, our exhibition. So continuing with the pyramid theme, um, so five pairs of sword pyramids were found in the Staffordshire Horde belonging to the warrior, and they would have belonged to the warrior elite. They would have been attached to leather straps that join the sword in its scabbard to a belt, and those that helped, and they helped um, keep the sword in its scabbard. Uh, the Anglo-Saxons love riddles in both words and images, and often designs can have one than, more than one meaning or interpretation. So this pyramid is packed if not overflowing with different uh, imagery sources. Um, so we can see here um, in the illustration picked out, we've got a helmet uh, and obviously Sutton Who thinking about the helmet here, but I was also reminded of this example from Italy um, from the late fifth, early sixth century as well. And we've got not only kind of uh, the helmet shape, but we've also got animals making up the helmet as well. So look at these things in lots of detail and um, the kind of gradual layers are revealed to you as, as you go. Sticking with the pyramids, um, these ones I'd just like to draw your attention to because today is a very momentous day. These uh, pyramids were the first gold objects discovered uh, during the 1939 Sutton Hoo Mound One investigation um, by Peggy Piggott on the 21st of July. So today, 83 years ago, these uh, little beauties came to light. Um, but as you can see, they're little kind of volcanoes erupting with rich ruby red garnets and um, bright blue glass inlays. And you can see the similarities here between the Staffordshire Horde and Sutton Hoo as well. Um, as well as um, receiving gold ornamented weapons, kings could bestow upon their thanes and warrior nobles sword rings as gifts in recognition of service or loyalty as symbols of status. Um, it was widespread tradition across Europe during the 5th and 7th centuries and taste changed with the time. So to begin with, it's uh, two interlinked metal rings attached to a sword hilt, which symbolised the unbreakable bond between um, the thane, warrior noble and the king, and later rings fixed forms were used and um, are later shown in the Staffordshire Horde, such as the examples um, here. Um, a gilt sword ring uh, was also found attached to the Sutton Hoo Mound One shield. So this is from the front of the shield near the bottom, po possibly to signify the king's role as um, a ring giver. I just wanted to, um, as I say, we are flicking through some of the amazing treasures here. We can only show you a couple this evening, but um, I just wanted to show this example to you of another similarity between the Staffordshire Horde and Sutton Hoo, um, where things have been expressed in a different way. So we've got uh, a pair of collars here from the Staffordshire Horde, which have cut garnets with a beaded surface. And the only parallel for that are the button fittings from the Sutton Hoo Mound One sword scabbard. And there are also button fittings with in the Staffordshire Horde as well. So lots of different parallels in terms of object form and decorative techniques being used between the two collections. Um, something that's not represented at Sutton Hoo is um, a Sayax. And uh, one set of gold and garnet cloisonne fittings from a Sayax, a long fighting or hunting knife. Um, so Sayax is generally uh, classified to have a blade longer than 18 centimetres. And uh, this extraordinary, exquisite uh, set was found in the Staffordshire Horde, and it could have been made for a prince or king of East Anglia. Um, they were used in close quarters, fighting conditions where space is restricted, such as in the press of battle. And in Beowulf, Grendel's mother uses a Sayax during the struggle with Beowulf, and Beowulf uses a Sayax to kill the wounded dragon. Sticking with our similarities between Sutton Hoo and the Staffordshire Horde, uh, just want to talk about, so we've seen the Sayax on the previous slide, and here we've got the Mound One Sutton Hoo shoulder clasp as well. And you can see um, that uh, the similarities in terms of the zoomorphic interlay. So here we've got the shoulder clasp up here, the Sayax here, and just, um, yeah, so much kind of similarity in terms of the design. 
but the study of the collars of the um, the SEAX, which is what's represented here, has um, identified some differences. So there's very few joins visible on the SEAX hilt fitting uh, collars. And stylistically, the ornamentation appears to be of a slightly later date. So could they be the same creations of a master goldsmith working in an East Anglian workshop for potentially the same person or family? So maybe the shoulder class came first and then inspired by that, somebody said, I'd like that, but on a Seax instead. Um, continuing with the kind of same workshop series, just going to show you a couple of examples of um, yeah, why we think that some of the objects from Sutton Hoo and the Staffordshire Hall were made in the same workshops in East Anglia. So first of all, we're going to talk about a Y-shaped detail, which is kind of picked out quite nicely here in the graphic, um, on lots of the, um, the bird beaks um, across uh, Sutton Hoo and the Staffordshire Hoard. So we've got here um, the um, iconic kind of pieces from Sutton Hoo as well. Um, and um, yeah, so lots of birds all across kind of Anglo-Saxon uh, craftsmanship here. And evidence has been found recently at nearby Rendlesham, which is a couple of miles away from Sutton Hoo, of high status metalwork, suggestive that it could be a potential workshop site. Um, I should also say that not only are these uh, shared stylistic signature details an indicator for this kind of similar workshop theory, but also obviously the, the quality of the Garnet Cloisonne work that we're seeing as well. Another shared uh, similarity is the mushroom shapes that you can see here on the Cloisonne work. And here we've got um, the dummy sword buckle uh, fitting from Sutton Hoo Mound 1. And here again, seen on the Staffordshire Hoard and quite nicely picked out there. So mushrooms, we think, um, mean that they're from the same workshop. As well as kind of similarities in uh, design, we can see here um, where something has uh, kind of a direct kind of uh, correlation. So we've got the animal design from around the collar of the mound one, uh, one of the mound one uh, Sutton Hoo maple cups appears to have been copied over to the Staffordshire Hall's great processional cross. And that was potentially carried on to the battlefield by churchmen. The cross is in the Eastern Roman tradition, but combined uh, Germanic pagan customs. So looking at these uh, pagan kind of um, what we would say pagan uh, bestial ear forms on the, uh, the end of each cross there as well. So the dye used to make the cross may have been based on the actual bronze dyes used to make the cup ornamentation. So fueling this idea of there being one master workshop that's serving both of these um, collections. And obviously you can see here um, the real similarity in the design, it's slightly different, but obviously it looks like it's been a direct kind of influence. Um, so not um, so just thinking about the Staffordshire Hoard, there's lots of evidence of cut marks and impressions left by smithing tongs can be seen on many of the objects, and some have been crumpled, torn, bended and folded. Um, and obviously these raw materials were valuable, but one of the theories is by literally pulling apart a sword, was that a symbolic act of pulling apart your enemy and wreaking further revenge or simply a systematic and efficient means of quickly reaping the spoils of war from the battlefield? So these are some of the theories, but as you can see here, we've got the, a lovely kind of slice mark um, through this collar here, and then all the markings, it's quite hard to tell on the photographs, but um, in the illustration they've pointed out where uh, we can see See that everything is not as it was when it was kind of um, originally made. There has these uh, objects have lived a life, and uh, what are those stories, and what tales do they have to hold? One of the um, probably um, questions that we get a lot is um, why? Why was the Staffordshire Hall buried? Why was it collected? And these are just some of the possible theories in circulation as to why the Staffordshire Hall was collected and buried. We may never know exactly why, but what we do know, though, is that it seems as though the craftspeople involved in the, uh, that, sorry, that craftspeople were involved in the dismantling process. It was people that knew what they were doing. It's a specially selected collection of specific objects and materials that have been um, gathered together and unlikely to be from the immediate aftermath of just one battle. So it's potentially something that happened um, over you know, many years, collecting these objects together, and then um, they were buried at some point for some particular reason. Um, but a great emphasis was made on prestige and ceremonial objects in terms of the, um, the deposition there. 
Um, that has been a very whistle stop tour through the exhibition. I'm really sorry also, again, everyone that my uh, PowerPoint wasn't working uh, quite as it should have done. Um, but I hope that that has whetted your appetite to come and have a look at the exhibition itself. Um, the exhibition is on display at Sutton Hoo until the end of October. Um, and we are recommending, um, so you need to book your tickets to come and see the exhibition. So there's limited availability each day to see it. So please Please do if you'd like to come and see us please visit the National Trust Sutton Hoo website to book your ticket and come and see some of these objects up close and personal and then just at the top there I've just included some of the feedback we've had on the exhibition so far um, thank you very much wonderful Laura thank you so much and thank you everyone for your patience as somebody pointed out in the chat it is not a virtual webinar unless there's some sort of technical <laughs> hitch so somebody somebody's got to take it Laura so well done for for being that person um absolutely wonderful keep popping questions please in the Q&A section and we will answer them at the end um but FYI there's uh two ways of looking so you can look at the National Trust website for Sutton Hoo um and I think she's just put the link for booking in the chat um also the CBA Festival of Archaeology activities that are happening at Sutton Hoo now and as Mark said at Fountains as well a few people have asked for details of the events that Mark was talking about so if you follow the CBA Festival of Archaeology website <clears throat> and for the events at Fountains you can find the times there <clears throat> excuse me without further ado <clears throat> sorry there you go another another thing going wrong someone losing their voice um without further ado we will go to our last speaker Nancy Grace right hello I hope everyone can hear me good evening from a, a sultry Weymouth in Dorset um I'm going to, I'm a National Trust Archaeologist in the Southwest region, and a lot of my work involves uh, looking after the collections, uh, as well as doing a bit of digging and survey and all the other things that the rest of the archaeologists do. Um, but over the last 30 years, um, most of my work has been with objects. Uh, so when the festival theme came out as being journeys, uh, I decided um, it would be good to look at some of the journeys of some of the objects that we find uh, on our sites. So I'm afraid I can't promise you any bling uh, like Laura's great, um, wonderful objects from, from Sutton Hoo and Staffordshire, the Staffordshire Horde, but they're all precious to us and have lovely stories to tell, even though they're mainly bits of um, little bits of things. Sometimes you get big bits like the, the pot you see on your screen now. Uh, so this is um, black burnish ware, which was made uh, in the Iron Age and through into the Roman period. And it came, um, a big production site was not far from where I am now, uh, down in Dorset, around Pool Harbour. So that's one of that, well, that's the main production site of black burnish ware. Black Burnish Ware one because there is pottery made in the east of the of the uh, country known as Black Burnish Ware two. Um, this pottery vast industry around Pool Harbour. Uh, there was one site, a uh, gravel site at Besswell near Wareham, and they uncovered uh, thirty nine kiln sites, still with their last firings in, um, and lots of waste material tons and tons it's quite a, it's a domestic ware and this pottery is found all over Roman Britain and especially up on Hadrian's Wall or as far as Hadrian's Wall apparently every mile castle has found that burnished ware there when they've done the excavations this could be to do with well it's to do with trade but not just trade in pottery but probably something was being transported in these jars, as we call them. Uh, there was salt production around here, around the edge of Pool Harbour as well. Um, but also, uh, if tradition goes right through into the medieval period, they also transported wool, because it was a good way to keep your pots from breaking. So you want to, when you're uh, trading uh, in objects, you want to make sure that you make the best use of the transport. So you don't want to send empty pots when you could actually send something else with it to make more money and and make the most of the journeys. Because it's quite a long way from down here in the Roman period up, even though these are all nice uh, roads 
although the Vinlander um, tablets are telling us that the roads weren't very good. So, <laughs> so you especially don't want rough roads if you're transporting pottery. Come on. Oh, is it going to move? Oh dear, technical issue again. Don't worry, can you manually do it? <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> So some of the sites, we're going to have a look at some of the objects from, well, some of the pottery uh, is down here along the Dorset coast, along the edge of the Lime, of Lime Bay. We've done a lot of excavations along this coast because those who know it know that it's actually collapsing quite regularly into the sea. So we've been doing quite a bit of, um, uh, sorry, that's just thrown me because that shouldn't be coming up yet. <laughs> um, we've done quite a lot of work because of coastal erosion, uh, trying to actually record the sites before they fall off the cliff and get washed away. So the first site is Doghouse Hill. So this is uh, Portland in the distance here and West Bay is just here. If you know Broadchurch, the, the, uh, the TV series, it, that's where they filmed Broadchurch. And this is our site on the very edge of the cliff. So you can see there's the edge of the cliff running through here. Uh, and conveniently, this is a, um, a slump in the cliff. So this is an, a, a, a scar of where the cliffs are slumped because they've, it's actually clay, um, it's clay underneath so it's the ground above is slipping the green sand is slipping on the clay and that's what's causing all the cliff collapses so uh, we saved ourselves some digging by using the scar of the, the slip this site we found some pottery not a lot it's a bronze age site and this is a lovely little bronze age piece of pottery there's a close-up it's got corded decoration. So this decoration is where someone's twisted a cord and pushed it into the clay. Now, when you're excavating on a site, you often know what sort of pottery you're going to encounter. So you know all the local sort of pottery to that area. So when you see something like this, you know instantly that it's not, well, you know, it's unusual. So you spot the things that don't seem quite right. And this piece of pottery didn't seem quite right for the, for the site, not the local wares that you get to the east, the Devil Rimbury pottery, which is further over to Weymouth, the site. Um, so we had this looked at by a specialist and they told us it comes from Travisca. So down here near Bodmin. So this pottery, when we find pottery, the way we can tell where they come from is by looking at the type of clay that it's made from, uh, the, what we call the inclusion, so the things that are added to the clay to help with the firing, and also the form and the design, so this twisted corded design and the shape of the rim, uh, as well as the clays, gave us a clue that it came from down here, because an excavation was done down here at Travisca where they found the kiln sites, so that's another good indication for being able to pinpoint exactly where things like pottery come from is if you find the kill site. So like at Bestwall with the uh, Black Burnish Ware uh, and down here, if you're lucky, you'll find a kiln site and you can actually pinpoint the exact place that things come from. So archaeologists were great storytellers. So how did that port in the Bronze Age come all the way to the Dorset coast? What brought it there or who brought it there? So this is where we can start thinking about uh, other trade and travel. Maybe somebody, an itinerant trader had gone down to Cornwall, maybe had gone to get some uh, copper, uh, um, tin, sorry. Uh, he'd gone to get some tin from down in Cornwall uh, and on his way he'd stopped off at Travisca and um, maybe he thought, oh, they look interesting in pots. I'll take them back for uh, people I know that would like a nice pot from Cornwall. Or maybe he encountered a, a young lady he liked and this is part of her dowry that she brought with him when she moved with him to West Dorset. So we're we can find out about these objects 
find out where they were made, uh, often to the actual sites that they were made. Um, but how they got, how they journeyed, the journey of them is the thing that we're interested in. So trading status, what was in them that was being traded as well, um, which there's another scientific technique uh, called lipid analysis, uh, which can analyze what's soaked into the clay in a pot. So uh, you can tell whether they had mutton stew, whether they were being used for holding uh, cheese, um, so if there's techniques where we can actually home right down into what these objects were actually used for, not just where they came from. Another site along the Dorset coast, looking the other way from Doghouse Hill over to the west, uh, start point in Devon right round there on a clear day. This is Golden Cap here that some might know. Uh, another iconic site, the highest uh, cliff on the south coast. Uh, and this is another site that, as you can see, is about to drop off the cliff um, that we excavated, a uh, burnt mound site. But whilst going down to the burnt mound, which turned out to be early Bronze Age, late Neolithic, um, we came across some Iron Age material. And this lovely little piece of black pot with a cross decoration. These are my little jewels, although I like a nice garnet, but <laughs> these are little jewels to me. Again, it was pottery we didn't recognize uh, as being local to that area. And again, the specialists came back uh, having analyzed the clays and what is in the clays that it comes from round Exeter, Exeter, it's known as Southwest Decorated Ware, which is found as far away as Glastonbury. So it's, it's got quite a large distribution, but the actual analysis of the clays and what's in the clays has pinpointed it around this area, around Exeter. Um, although no doubt more, more work will be done and they'll split it uh, and they'll probably come across other sites over here that do a very similar design. Maybe um, traveling uh, potters in the medieval period. Uh, they've done research and think that potters traveled around because you get the same styles and the same types of pottery. And they dig clay out of one village, then move on and go to another place, leaving the clay to weather for a year uh, and go to a, a work on pot. Um, clay they dug out on another site and then a year later they'd come back and they'd use that and start making in the one that they dug out the, the year before um, but I don't think there's a lot more research uh, to be done on that side of things especially with prehistoric pot I'm not sure that that's that's the case so moving on to another iconic site which is down here in the Isle of Purbeck Sorry, it's very Dorset, but I've done a lot of work in Dorset. And as I'm, I live here, I, I sort of know it very well, and especially Corf Castle. This is where I started my career with the National Trust on April 7th, 1986, as fine supervisor on the excavations that we did at Corf. There's Pool Harbour over here, and you can see how the mound of Corf sits in the gap between the Dorset Ridgeway, guarding the gap from both sides. Now, this is quite an interesting tale of a pot we found uh, at Corf. So, and the journey that it went on um, was sort of virtual and in the ether as well as uh, physically. Here I am back then in 1986. <laughs> I still got the still got the plats. <laughs> uh, excavating next to the guardhouse at Corf, and this is a window here that is in situ and I'm excavating some of the window glass that has been blown out when the castle was purposely destroyed. So Corf was in uh, was a royal treasury from uh, the early 1100s and was a royal castle right through until Elizabeth I sold it to Sir Christopher Hatton, one of her favorites, a dance tutor. Um, and he then sold it to the Banks family and John Banks was Lord Chief Justice Charles I. So in the Civil War, uh, they were on the King's side and, and 
two sieges happened at Corfe, and on the, the second siege, someone let them in the back door, and so the castle was taken. They then spent six months sort of blasting it apart and undermining the walls. So we're excavating some of the evidence from that, and I don't know, you probably can't see, but down here there's a little round thing and a little curved thing, and this is part of a pot that we excavated with three handles. Uh, a curious object. No one was quite sure what it was used for. Um, the pottery specialists thought it was probably continental, maybe German or um, the Low Countries, just from the clay. No idea what it was used for. We thought maybe oil or something on a table with three handles. You might be able to then reach it from wherever you were on the table. Um, and 25 years after finding it, we revisited the pottery reports and Lorraine Meppen from Wessex Archaeology was curious. She'd never encountered anything that looked like that before. Um, and so she decided with the uh, wonders of Facebook to put it on the Facebook site, uh, Medieval Pottery and Post-Medieval Pottery Facebook site. This had come from, as you saw, the civil civil war level, so the, the uh, 1640s level. So we knew it was it was from that sort of period. Um, and she heard back from fairly quickly from someone in the Netherlands, and I see there's someone uh, uh, listening to this who's from the Netherlands, so they'll be glad to hear about this. Um, they came back with this illustration, and it's a stank potten, uh, and it's a grenade. So it's nothing to do with tableware. Uh, it's actually a grenade uh, used, um, well, as all grenades are, um, to put a fuse on and, and lob. Um, this particular one, um, usually they're made from um, either metal or there are some pottery ones found at Basing House, but they just have the typical like cartoon bomb with the with the fuse in the top. And they're earthenware pottery ones from Basing House, but others that have been found have been metal. So this was a, quite a surprise. Uh, and what they would do is they'd excavated some from this site in, and I can't see that, this Visslinger. Um, and they'd found what was inside them. Uh, and I'll just have to, um, there's a recipe that they would put gunpowder, sulfur, camphor, pitch, linseed oil. Um, the one from the Netherlands that they had excavated had pepper seeds, charcoal, pitch and sulfur, among other things in it. And you would tie fuses, one to each handle. You would then light them. You would tie a rope around this neck. So if I go back to the pot, you would tie a rope around here, seal it and throw it. And when it broke, the fuses would set light to what was inside it. So you would get smell and smoke. So maybe the one outside the window, they'd missed, they'd missed going through the window and it had hit the wall and was outside because this is outside the castle. So 25 years later, we solved the mystery. So archeology, span even though you excavate and you find things and you think you know about what you've found, there's always a puzzle and there's always there's always things cropping up. That's the exciting thing about archaeology. There's always new things appearing, new um, new research, new sites, um, and things like this that we didn't know about. So the Corf one is the only one known of this form, um, even though there's records from Oxford of uh, grenades being brought from the Netherlands. So maybe um, this is part of that consignment. Um, sorry, Kelly, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure of the timing, so I'm not quite sure how long I've got. If you can ping that to me, that'd be good. Um, so another site, so the good old Romans. Here's Chedworth Roman Villa in Gloucestershire. Um, there's the cover building um, that we put up a few years ago to expose more of the mosaics. 
and we were working, doing some work down here as well, looking at whether uh, we would be putting a cover building over if there were more mosaics down this wing of the villa. And this is the museum, purpose-built museum, um, from when it was found in the 1860s, so quite an old purpose-built museum on a site at Chedworth Villa. So the pottery side of the Romans, I'm just going to touch on um, the Samian, which is the posh stuff from posh stuff from um, France. So we've got a journey of this pottery coming over from France. Again, it's quite um, so you know it's status thing. You've got this posh, fancy pottery with all these fancy designs on, and we know they were obviously treasured because you often find where they've been broken, holes are drilled either side of a of a break and a metal staples put on to keep it held together. So people obviously um, liked the idea, loved their objects and just used them as objects like we do now with um, pots and that we have on our sideboards or on our mantel shelves. If they break, we try and stick them back together and keep them there. And one last thing I'll quickly, quickly, quickly do as I've only got a minute um, and it's not pottery, but just because it's an interesting journey, a small piece of glass that we found at Chedworth, probably sort of second century. It's a small piece and it's part of a fish, which would have been a bottle, an unguent or potion bottle and the mouth you would have put your little dabby stick in to get your perfume or your unguent from. Um, this again was an unknown and we weren't very sure <laughs> where it came from, it's unusual. And the late professor, Jenny Price, spent a few years going around every expert in the world and hunting every museum. And she finally found a parallel in the Corning Museum in New York, but with no provenance. Um, and this is what our fish would have looked like, but we've put a red head on it because the one in the Corning Museum has a red head. There was a, a an excavation of a grave in the Crimea and a similar thing was found in that grave. And I think the consensus is that this little fish at some point had been transported all the way from somewhere around the Black Sea, maybe Crimea or even Ukraine. So quite a poignant uh, find in this present climate. Um, and so that's our longest traveled object. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. That's amazing. Really, really exciting stuff. Um, there's some various questions that have come up for all of our panelists, uh, which I will start to field. Um, there's been a few responses to sort of more general comments. As I said, there is information on websites about timings um, for all of those properties are doing things for the Festival of Archaeology uh, over the next week and a half. So do check out both the CBA and the National Trust websites, you'll find all the details on those. Um, and I will start, we'll start from the beginning, shall we, which makes a lot of sense. Um, Mark, quick question for you regarding parch marks. Obviously, we mentioned that this weather has uh, brought out a lot of parch marks. So one of our sort of, one of the benefits of it being warmer, I suppose, that doesn't, maybe that doesn't come across well, um, is that we actually can find a lot of archaeology and some really interesting things. So um, Daz is asking, sure. have we found any more, seen any more scorch marks, parch marks at fountains recently? In, in terms of fountains and this year, uh, the answer is no, uh, but part of that's because I haven't looked. Um, <laughs> it hasn't been a, an opportunity to go and check again. I, I'm intending to do so at the weekend. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be a fabulous year for our, uh, for parch marks in our part of the world because it has been so dry for so long. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that kind of drying out that you get is what tends to tip vegetation over. I think, you know, the vegetation is ready to tip over quite quickly. So that moment of transition where the hard surfaces underneath are giving it, it is, you know, I think that will come and go quite fast. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're there at just the right moment, you might catch it. Otherwise, everything's brown and all bets are off until next year. Fair enough. Um, a, another quick question. Um, well, actually, I'll, I'll sort of semi-field this one for you, Mark. Um, Sarah is asking about finding about more 
of the more about the research that you've been talking about at fountains and obviously some of the stuff that mark's talking about is very new and there isn't um there isn't public access to that information so this was a real sort of um yeah really exciting chance to hear about some of that new stuff um but in terms of wider research more general research for for fountains mark where else can they look gosh that's a good question we're, <laughs> we're not as good as getting stuff out or uh, out uh, you know on the internet and things like that as we would like to be we would always like to to add more and as a professional community we're talking a lot about that um the the specifics projects that i've talked about are still research in progress and we want to make sure we have got it right and it's all peer reviewed before it ends out there so i can't point you to anywhere very easy though i am hoping in fact um that this was an opportunity to say there's a very good mm -hmm. book on the estate is the ideal midsummer present for all your your your, your your, your family and friends um and available at all good bookshops recently back in print shameless plug shameless plug brilliant yeah mark. well as i say to a friend of mine it's rather like rats in london i'm never further than six feet away from <laughs> um simon has a question about uh the river yes you did see a river flowing through fountains um water obviously very important to to all human life but mark could you just explain a little bit about the interaction with the river at fountains that's really a great question and, and thank you for asking it. <clears throat> the scale, the river scale is, was really the reason why the abbey was there and it was going to be put to so much use by the monastery. Um, so it's not that the first monks necessarily realised this, but very quickly it became obvious that Mountain, Fountains was going to be an unusually large community and the processes that you need to keep a large community alive, processing food, quintessentially important that you have a mill. So the first use of a water uh, on the site was for a monastic mill, which is still with us and is the earliest in use building in the National Trust. The earliest part of the building we think goes back to 1138 uh, and continued milling from then until the early 1900s. But the, the Cistercians were wonderful water engineers. So as well as running the mill from water sources, from tributaries running into it, we have uh, water-driven machinery for metalworking, um, if the parallel site at Bordsley is anything to go by, but also used for wool fulling and for other industrial processes. It then goes on a little bit further. They don't drink the water very much because they actually have a piped water supply brings in fresh water from a spring source uh, three miles away, uh, which would have been used for that. Um, and most important of all in monastic life, more even more important than drinking it, was washing. And cleanliness is next to godliness. And there's piped water supplies for ablutions in the cloister, which were part, the monks would prepare themselves before going in for, uh, for a meal. Then the water goes further, it acts, uh, it flushes their lavatories that drop directly into it, great batteries of, of rare daughters dropping into there um, for the lay brethren and then the monks. And then we go a little bit further downstream and the river is canalised underneath the infirmary uh, block where amongst his other functions is waste disposal from the kitchens. There are stone grills in the floor of the kitchens, they drop the waste through into the river. And then the next process that we know about uh, on beyond that uh, is now the tannery. Um, and not only would the water have been useful for, uh, for washing the skins in parts of the process, but again there is potential that there may have been water driven machinery at that point as well. Wonderful. Um... I'll do this question first because it's a little quicker. Uh, do you have any evidence of where they were getting the lime from for tanning? We don't have a monastic um, lime source clearly identified, but one end of the estate is the, the scale cuts through sandstone. And just as you're getting to the end of the monastic precinct, it's then magnesium limestone. And most of the limestone exposures were worked, have either eroded or were, were worked at later dates. So the medieval stuff hasn't hasn't survived, but you know it's it's just about into the corner of the precinct. And then there are better ex exposures within a few hundred feet. Mm -hmm. So very locally, we think. Okay, and I think the last questions around fountains. Um, so Ria, you have a, a whole bunch of questions about the graves. Um, and I know that's, I mean, the, the scale of Mark saying 
some 2000 burials is, is mind boggling. Um, so she has a series of questions, which partly I can answer and, and help you out, Mark. So are the remains of the monks still in the graves? Did they know before um, before the, the GPS and the, um, GPS, the GPR, sorry, and the geophysics uh, where the cemetery was? Um, and has there been any research done on any of the remains? And if not, will there be? So firstly, if you remember the, the picture of, of the area, the land is quite limited. So I think probably, Mark, you suspected where the burials were, were going to be given yeah. the layout of the valley. The monastic, yeah, the monastic cemetery um, was identified by Walbrun in 1852, though I have to say it came as a surprise to him. He thought it was the abbot's garden and then there were gravestones in it. So that was a bit weird. Um, so it's not just me looking for a drain and finding a bunch of graves. Um, it, it's been done before. So the cemetery was known, but you kind of put a label on it and then people had not thought about it very hard. And obviously what we've done has opened up most enormous new chapters of, of research. The remains are there in the ground. And it was very interesting when we first went public with this discovery that we had very polarized reactions. And we had people online saying, great, dig it all up and we can we can do osteological studies and find out loads of stuff about the monks. Um, and we had another community of people who said, don't touch it, leave them alone, leave them at rest. And I think I'm very much with the latter camp. If one, the more you start to understand what medieval people believed about death and the life to come, the more you realize that those burials are there for the purposes for which they originally deposited. And I think particularly a place which is so imbued in the religious story, that's a really quintessentially important part of how the site is made up and how we understand it. It's not how people go and visit it now, but it is a way in which we can understand the place. And to be honest, um, quite a lot of what we'd be likely to learn from the burials uh, would be that they are you know, quite mature um, men, um, relatively well fed compared with, with other medieval people. Uh, you might do, do a little bit about where they came from, but other than that, you'd, you'd need to dig the whole cemetery in order to make any sense of it, which would be very destructive of something that has survived for the better part of a thousand years. But the interesting bit is that this should be a monastic cemetery full of mature males. But the Victorians recovered remains of, uh, 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 remains of a child. And what we have done is excavated a section of that drain run so that we could actually have a physical piece of archaeology which to evaluate the radar stuff and correlate that the radar was telling us the truth. So we just took the backfill out of the Victorian drain and we didn't know if there would be human remains surviving in that. We knew the Victorians had seen it, but did, would they survive? Nevertheless, we had exhumation licenses. We talked to the diocese. We talked to Mount St. Bernard, the only Cistercian Abbey in the country uh, now in England, and had the abbot's agreement that it was an appropriate thing to do. And we did find some human remains that had been disturbed uh, and returned to the drain cut. In order to show them maximum respect, we didn't take them out of the trench and we 3D scanned them in the hole in the ground and the osteologists have done their work from there. And at the end of the, immediately at the end of the, of the, of the operation, they were put to rest again where they'd come from. Um, and the remains include three more children under 10. So as the Cistercians don't take novices until they're 16 officially, it asks some very quite interesting questions about who these people are and how diverse that population was. And that's a whole new opening chapter into the, the social history of the Abbey um, that we're just working our way into at the moment. Writing that up can be your retirement plan, Mark. Yeah, so my, pension, my pension advisor says, don't even think about retirement. <laughs> <But> <laughs> it'll keep me going for a while yet. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. I think that's the majority of the questions that have come through for Fountain. So we'll move on to um, some questions for Laura. Um, so Simon is asking, uh, have there, has there been any testing on the gold uh, or the glass or the garnet um, to prove similar sources to sort of identify where the material is coming from and see if it's all all being sourced from the same place? I guess I, I think that's what you're asking, Simon. 
Yes, yeah, I should say um, a lot of research has been done, not by me, um, but by the Staffordshire Hoard um, community, I guess, uh, into this fascinating collection. And um, if I can wheel across, I will also, like Mark, show you a book. It's not a book I've written, but this is the definitive source on the Staffordshire Hoard, bear with me. I will say we do sell this in the shop as well at Sutton Hoo. So if you come to visit the exhibition, this is the book you need, this weighty tomb. And this will tell you all about um, lots of the different kind of uh, analysis that they've done. So obviously when Sutton Hoo was discovered in 1939, you know, technology has moved on so much. And I think more recent finds such as the Staffordshire Hoard, you know, it's a lens to look at further back in history, but also for us to learn so much more as well. So it's really helped um, our understanding of Sutton Hoo by by having the Staffordshire Hoard as well. But yes, I would recommend uh, this book to anyone that wants to know more about the Staffordshire Hoard. And there's lots of amazing um, research online as well that's made accessible. Um, the book is also available online as well to people, but um, probably too much to go into this evening, but there's a lot out there uh, talking about the gold and obviously where the garnets have come from and uh, different garnets from different places, um, Bohemia, Sri Lanka, India. So, you know, this kind of perception of the Anglo-Saxons as an insular, in looking people is much um couldn't be further removed from the truth really so yes i will promote that book i'm not on commission it's a uh, it's a hefty tome that book isn't it um yes. the I, I think as well the rendlesham project have a website as well so they update on some of the work um i know i should just be bigging up sutton who because i'm national trust but rendlesham site is very very interesting and they have a big um community uh sort of engagement on their website as well so if anyone wants to know what's going on there there'll be some information on that site um another question laura about um, sort of the art and design that you find in the objects is there any evidence um, of any sort of perception of their cosmos so are there any indications that they use the design to show their sort of cosmological out like perceptions I suppose yeah it's um it's, it's quite a hard one I mean I'm sitting um, I'm sitting at my desk at the moment and to the side of me I have got a postcard from like the Nebra Sky Disc having been to see the Stonehenge exhibition recently at the BM so we haven't got anything that's I guess as literal as that but I think with the Anglo-Saxons it's quite hard at this point at Sutton who we're not having it's not a literate culture insofar as that they're writing down their thoughts their feelings their beliefs so we can read into a lot of the objects different things but we don't know for certain exactly what they thought we don't know exactly their perceptions of um you know the afterlife and I think sometimes we do need to make um be quite careful that we're not putting our own words in their in their mouths as well but having said that that's one of the great things about studying this period is that you can put forward your own theories and perceptions but there's nothing I can think of that's a, a kind of direct cosmos um relationship but that's not to say that it, it doesn't exist in some way I suppose the closest thing would be the use of animals wouldn't it that animals will have certain meanings uh, oh, to, the yeah, to the people who are portraying them and whether you could link those back to the sort of their wider world views and stuff so yeah there will be a lot of research on that um, so definitely worth looking up um, from Daz uh, how so a question that he gets asked a lot when he's doing tours yep. out there um, yep. <laughs> how are the garnets cut to fit in the tiny tiny spaces that they fit in Yes, yeah, so as uh, Darren will well know from the exhibition hall at Sutton Hoo, so we have um, during our releasing the Sutton Hoo story project, um, one of our new replicas is um, one of the sword belt fittings from Sutton Hoo Mound One, and I was the lucky person that got to unwrap that, and it was a bit like Christmas Day really, but it was so so tiny, and when I installed that, that was with tweezers. Um, so, you know, amazing, mind-boggling craftsmanship. Um, how they did it, it's quite hard to say, really. So um, I know Theopolis, so a slightly different, you know, context, writing about kind of cutting kind of precious stones and things, talks about like, an iron saw and emery's. Um, there was a really interesting program that has escaped my memory um, a couple of years ago with Dr. Yanina Ramirez, where she went to a modern jeweler and got them to kind of value and show how they would make the shoulder clasps, which have so many garnets in. There's over 4,000 individual cut garnets used across the Sutton Hoo treasure. So, you know, they knew what they were doing. Um, 
so that's really interesting. Um, another plug, I would say, if anyone is in Suffolk this weekend, or even you don't have to be in Suffolk, you can come and see us. Um, we have Wolf Headness, our local kind of reenactment group, coming back to Sutton Hoo. It's been a while because of COVID that they've been able to visit. And with them comes Dave Roper, who's the master craftsman who makes many of our replicas. So he will be on hand to show kind of how, um, how he does it. Mm. And I know from speaking with Dave, you know, it is something that modern craftspeople do struggle to emulate you know the precision the quality of the anglo-saxon craftspeople so we're all in awe of how they do it um but yeah brilliant um tools uh, and and workmanship and craftsmanship there yeah um uh, there is one more question um it's sort of about access um because a lot of people have said they they are not able to attend the exhibition which is which is understandable um anna is asking um i, I think i know that we don't have a virtual walkthrough version of it but is there a view that that might be something that we could do or is that not a not because it's a short it's a very temporary exhibition this one it is yeah it is a very short temporary exhibition we are trying to upload um quite a few things <laughs> online um yeah it's not something that we, we haven't done a full kind of virtual exhibition for it but um we can certainly kind of post a bit more about the objects if that's the type of thing that people want i know that i've gone through a very smattering of some of the amazing objects today in a very whistle stop fashion but um we can we can put up some more stuff on social about some of the objects in focus if that would be of interest to people um yeah. but yeah it is it is a very special opportunity so but i appreciate not everyone's able to make it so um, social media, Facebook, for example, is, is National Trust Sutton Hoo or Sutton Hoo National Trust? Yeah, uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook, they're one way around and the other one. But okay. um, if you type in those words, you should down. find it. Yes, yeah. and we've got, um, you know, and we're doing um, Ask an Archaeologist later on this week. We're doing a Facebook Live. Um, hopefully the technology will work for that one. You should <laughs> see me on top of Mound One next Tuesday on Facebook. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot going on. So please do engage with us. But, yeah, National Trust Sutton Who you should be able to find us on Twitter, uh, Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, so Ruth has just followed up with that. Um, could you do a curator's tour on Facebook like the BM did for the Stonehenge um, exhibition? It, it's I don't think it's something that we can do now. I mean, obviously with the loan of material like that, we you know it's not just down to us because we don't own the material. But I think it's something that we we would like to look at further is our sort of digital access to some of these things because it, it is hard for people to get to them and we understand that but definitely um hit laura and the team up on facebook and other social media channels and if there's any sort of we'd love to see some images of things there's probably things that they can share um and i'll do a shameless plug now if you can't make it all the way to sutton who but you can get to cambridge there's a tiny very comparable piece of um saxon jewelry uh, some hairpins and a gold uh brooch that somebody in this room might have excavated so that's in the uh, Arcananth Museum in Cambridge there we go we've all done a shameless plug now um beautiful there are a few more questions that have come back from Mark but I'll move on to Nancy first if that's okay um so let's start with and Daisy I have seen your question that's a slightly broader one if you're still here so I'll answer that at the end or we'll get some of the panelists to answer it for you um does the last find, so the fish, the fish glass, have any similarities to the Phoenician glass fish? I don't know yeah. anything about that object. <laughs> uh, Nancy's yeah. like, oh. Well, <laughs> but I, as it was a bit of a rush at the end, I didn't get around to actually pointing out how the glass was made. Um, a lot of the fish bottles that you see in the fish glass um, are, have the same sort of design, but it's made by a process called cone glass, where the coloured layers are put on top of each other so that when you look from inside the glass as well as outside it looks the same whereas our glass fish bit from Chedworth is clear glass with the trail decoration is laid on top and that's the unusual thing about it that's what stumped everyone uh, and why uh, Professor Price, uh, why Jenny spent a long time consulting people and trying to find a parallel. Um, so luckily she did find something, but it was just a shame that the Koning Museum, their fish that was made the similar way didn't have any provenance. So no one knew where it came from to sort of help with tracing back. Um, and then luckily there was just this burial in Crimea that actually had one in a uh, burial of a, a lady. Very similar, not exactly the same, but very similar uh, in the way that it was actually made. So hopefully we might get uh, the tomb uh, 
um, mad glass makers <laughs> who are renowned for trying all these different techniques. Um, there's a video of them doing the cone glass. That's I saw that when we just found the fish. Somebody showed it to me, one of the reenactors that was on site at the time who knew them. So that's how I know the difference between the, the glass. It's amazing as archaeologists what you pick up from other things. You just soak all this interesting information in. So I'm not a specialist in glass, but I've sort of become a bit of a specialist in that fish. <laughs> <laughs> that one fish yeah I'm expert, that one fish um sarah's got a, a really sort of interesting question or, or point um it's not quite specifically um although nancy i know that you'll be quite passionate about this um so talking about um the story behind the journey so obviously every artifact everything that gets excavated everything that we that we hold has a story um and she sort of referenced the national portrait gallery that did some um sort of storytelling giving the voice to some of the more mysterious port portraits in their collection and just asking whether the trust would think about doing something like this um i mean i see that you've written the suggestion of a book i think to to, to put it in I couldn't even take a stab at the quantity of archaeological material that the trust holds. Um, but of the sites that we have recorded, and there might only be sort of a dot on a map, we have over 90,000 archaeological features or sites on record currently. But we are, as people, um, people like Mark with their geophysics, keep discovering more. We keep discovering more. So every bit of um, sort of landscapes change that we manage, every sort of uh, forest clearance, ash dieback, anything that we deal with has the potential to reveal a lot more archaeology, parch marks, things pop up in the summertime. So, you know, the, the number that we have is going to keep rising. Now, if you think about even though we don't do as much excavation, being a conservation organization, we don't do as much as say like an, an archeological unit that works in development. The quantity of material that we have is just mind boggling. Um, you know, not even counting the, the sort of what would be called the kind of curation collection, the, the kind of material that you see on display in the house, but the actual nitty gritty archeology span stuff, all the pottery, all the glass, all the nails, all the bone, everything else we have thousands millions of stories to tell and yes it is our goal that we would like to make that more accessible and and have those stories more open in some way but how we manage that on the scale that we're dealing with is um is quite a puzzle um nancy i don't know if you have anything more to add to that but it's, it's <laughs> definitely something that we're all passionate about but it's um yeah it's almost like a you know when you just sort of you know when you look at a big big mess and you just think i don't even know where to start with this there's so <laughs> much you know well, a lot of a lot of it is, um, yeah, because it's not just pottery and glass, and there's all these other objects uh, that have their stories to tell, not just about how they were produced and where they were from, how they were, you know, there's so many angles, uh, and a lot of university students we've had in the past have done dissertations on actual types of object, which they can do a lot of research into all that technical side, but they sort of. Um, more literary type thing would be brilliant. I, I was, during the uh, Cultural Olympiad, I was involved in two art projects. Um, one was with one of our objects, which was a Mesolithic flint barb um, from Portland, Portland Church. It was minute. Uh, and they scanned it and did a 3D scan model, a bigger model. But they also peeled its pelt so they scanned its surface and then peeled it off and opened it up so it looked a bit like a butterfly and it was part of the exhibition. So I've always been interested in the art side of using our objects as well. So the, the storytelling and the literature, oh, fact, there's so much, yeah, poems, stories, tales. I mean, that's what we're about, isn't it? Mm. It's the, the evidence and telling the stories. Um, so yeah, there's a vast reservoir of yeah bring it on <laughs> the, the people behind everything i've just been told that i need to remind everyone that there is a, a survey at the end of this so i know some people are, are having to leave and there's sort of a few questions left um but there is a three question survey at the end so please stick around for that and give feedback that'd be very very welcome um we do have um the collections management system cms which some records of things that we have archaeological and 
what you might consider not archaeological, though it all is really, I suppose, uh, material is available to look at online. Um, we also have the heritage records online, which shows you a lot of our sites and where we have archaeology or known archaeology, I should say, uh, at our, a lot of our places. Um, that will just tie me into a question from Suzanne. And Tom, I know that you're having internet trouble, so I don't know if you can um, type an answer into the chat if you can field this one. So she's asking, how easy is it to access National Trust archives? Um, she lives near Hewingdon and love to know what was there before the current house, uh, but there is nothing in the HER really. Um, I, I would love to answer that with a really clear cut answer, but I can't unfortunately because Partly I'm not from that region, uh, Tom is more local to that region, but also in the National Trust we have a, a range of complex relationships with the properties that we care for. So some of them we look after everything wholesale, some of them might be the house is actually owned by someone else and we own the land, some of them there are still um, donor families still living in places and they control the access to their archives. Um, there's a real mix, so depending on which property you're talking about, um, your best bet is to probably put a query in. Kelly, do we have a generic um, inquiries for archaeology? I think we do, don't we? For um, Kelly, I'm hoping Kelly's listening and she can yeah. put a, yeah. I'll share it in the chat. Yeah, thank you. So we have a generic um, sort of inquiry uh, email address that you can send things in and we can field those to the relevant archaeologists or curators or property teams. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I don't know about Hewington in particular, but it, it, that is a, it's a tricky one. I couldn't say yes, we definitely have it, or no, we definitely don't. Um, it will really depend. So sorry that I can't be a bit clearer about that. A um, couple more, let me just see if there's sort of fountains. Uh, someone cheekily asked if they get a discount on the bookmark, but that question yeah, has been- certainly, especially <laughs> for orders of over 10. <laughs> um, so um, just one that has popped up. Given the huge demands on the National Trust resources, the main role is conservation. Each year, property heart teams do condition surveys, uh, yet regularly, uh, regular issues and damage we find remain unresolved. How can the National Trust Archaeology Department help ensure such problems are addressed? That's, that's a really fair question. And, you know, I'm not going to lie, it's a massive challenge. And when you think about, goodness, Tom, I couldn't, I couldn't answer the question right now. The land that is in our care the scale of the land that is in our care and the fact that we have 16 archaeologists of which a few of them are full-time and the rest are part-time. Um, the, they cannot physically cannot get everywhere. So our heart teams where we have heart teams who are brilliant volunteers that work to identify sites and record the condition of existing known sites um, do a wonderful job in uh, in tracking some of the sort of condition issues that we are facing. However, the resources in the National Trust, we cannot get to fix everything at any one time. So essentially work is triaged by what is most significantly at risk or under threat um, and what is at most sort of severely damaged and needs sort of urgent response, essentially. Mark, are you putting your hands up? Sorry. Yeah, I was. And I think it's also part of the answer to that to say we, although there is this question of prioritization, we do hold ourselves accountable. And internally in the trust, we monitor our conservation performance across all the different areas of conservation with a thing called CPI. So that there is a numerical score for how well properties are looking after their archeology. span And if the archeology span on the properties we identified as one of its, uh, of its key features, then, it, then the ongoing poor condition you know, it kind of brings their property score down and it's something that is reviewed by the property and keeps it in the agenda. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you know, it is about this prioritization of limited resource, but it is not forgotten and it's not without consequence in our understanding of how well or badly we manage our properties. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a it's a fair shout because we do we are as Mark says we are responsible but um but we are trying um no but we do it doesn't it doesn't go away the problem doesn't go away and it will be picked up if it's not addressed um I will move on to another sort of quite broad um, question from Suzanne oh not Suzanne sorry oh has it disappeared there was a question oh there we go Daisy sorry um 
what do you recommend doing for a prospective uni student wanting to do archaeology and ancient history? Well, first of all, brilliant. It's very exciting that that's what you want to do. Um, I, I will start off and anyone else, please do chip in um, because we'll all have opinions on this. There's so many things that you can do. Um, so you could volunteer with local archaeology historical societies. You could um, ask local commercial units who do development led archaeology, whether they have room for trainees or you can do sort of volunteer work with them. Um, we are expanding our heart program, which is our heritage and archaeology ranger team to monitor the condition of archaeology across our places. So there'll be local groups, hopefully, possibly near you. I'm not sure where you are. Um, there's a number of different organizations that you can go and essentially volunteer with and sometimes train with. And there, there is also depending on if you're all set on doing an academic route is completely fine. Um, and a lot of them do involve a lot of field work or museum work or something else, something quite practical. But another way of looking at it is also the apprenticeship schemes. Um, so historic environment apprenticeship schemes are expanding as well. And there are more places taking them. We have two currently placed um, in the National Trust, which are brilliant, but other organizations such as Historic England, uh, Wessex Archaeology, um, I think there's one who's actually sitting in a planning, uh, local planning authority as well. There's lots of different ways that you could do it. Um, anybody else want to chip in with some suggestions? Uh, some of the units... I'm tempted to say, don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. <laughs> Robinson, or in a dig. <laughs> <laughs> Shush, Mark. <laughs> some of, like Bournemouth Uni offer, you can um, join their excavation. It's just finished, actually, but next year they're event writing it. So you can go on and, um, and work with them before you actually go into the uni as well. Mm. So check that out. Yeah, Tom, you're absolutely right. Talk to people like the Council for British Archaeology and oh, yes. National Trust archaeologists. Like, there is nothing that we all love more than getting people involved in archaeology. So, um, and another thing is putting an in, um, inquiry through the um, to the National Trust as well. And if there's any work happening anywhere local to you, like they, you know, they take you in a heartbeat because, you know, we like talking about the things that we love <laughs> to anyone who will listen. <laughs> um wonderful um oh uh one question that just popped up to mark uh what was the book that you found at fountains was it a bible i, do, I take it that's not referring to the one i wrote I, no 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 um, no, 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 no. Bible. <laughs> i wish i could say we found it at fountains but we didn't we found it in the catalog of the british library and it's a psalter so uh, not ra rather than a bible there are probably a couple of dozen fountains books in existence in libraries around the world the most fun of which is a bestiary of which there are pages in new york and if mm -hmm. you search online you'll find those mm -hmm. yeah things Wonderful. that might be real animals and things that very definitely weren't yeah um right that has been wonderful one last plug social media channels national trust archaeology uh cba there's so so much on social media now uh, on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. So by all means, get involved. And sometimes that can be a really, really great way to find out some amazing information really quickly. So um, as much as we can put at your fingertips, we like to try and do that. So thank you very much. I don't know if there's any more questions. I think we will call it oh. an evening. Oh, the questionnaire. Yes. Sorry. My third time for reminding. It's very short. It won't take very long. So if you could please answer the questions, that would be wonderful. Thank you.